Okay, so welcome back to the second video on Ephrin A, axon growth cones and retinal ganglion cells. I've turned on another light, it's still quite blue, that's because the sky's turned a beautiful blue colour outside. Uh, I can't do anything about the sky's colour, but um, we'll, we'll press on another one anyway. So, we were discussing voltage-gated potassium channels. So, they're made up of uh, four different protein subunits that are separate polypeptides. And these four subunits come together to make the pore forming unit. Okay, and uh, when um, the sodium channels start closing, the potassium channels have just about got around to opening. Uh, so these start opening, and they allow potassium ions to move out. So you get a potassium current going out of the cell, and that's moving positive charge out of the cell. So it's going to raise the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment, lower the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment, and therefore repolarize the membrane, make the electrical potential difference more negative. So it goes back down like that, and you get the usual action potential. Um, um, look, you get the usual action potential across the, happening across this membrane. Okay, right. So what's going to happen across this membrane is because this neuron is continually firing, what you're going to get is a continuous trail of action potentials, basically. So you're going to get this happening multiple times and in a row. Okay, right. So you've got this pulsatility of electrical activity happening across uh, this membrane of this axon growth cone. Right, so what you have now also in this membrane is you have voltage-gated calcium channels. Now these are another beast. So let's go over the structure of a voltage-gated calcium channel. Okay, so let's start with the pore-forming subunit of the voltage-gated calcium channel. And basically, just like the voltage-gated sodium channel, we divide the um, structure of the voltage-gated calcium channel into four domains. Again, domain one through four. Uh, but, you know, it's coded for by a single polypeptide. It's made up of a single polypeptide. It's not made up of four different polypeptides. It's made up of a single one that forms all four domains. So even though we divide it up into four dom uh, domains, and it's because they, you know, they are pretty much identical, these four domains. Uh, so the polypeptide does repeat on itself. It is a single polypeptide. Okay, right. So, voltage-gated calcium channels consist of an alpha-1 subunit, which is this single polypeptide making up the pore-forming subunit, and then they have a bunch of auxiliary subunits. So they have gamma subunits over here, they have a beta subunit down here somewhere, uh, they have an alpha-2 delta subunit sitting up here and controlling where the position of the um, voltage-gated calcium channel is. The point is that this is a voltage-gated calcium channel, and when, when, um, when this membrane is depolarized, what happens is that these open. So at some, these will have some sort of threshold potential, which might be similar to the threshold potential for the voltage-gated sodium channels. So maybe they open every time you get to negative 40 millivolts. So they're going to open on each one of these action potentials. Now, calcium concentration is much higher extracellularly than it is intracellularly. Calcium concentration extracellularly is generally about uh, 1.5 millimolar, okay? So that's quite high. Whereas calcium concentration intracellularly is 100 nanomolar. So it's not, you know, it's on a completely different scale intracellularly than it is extracellularly. Nanomolar is 10 to the negative 6 of millimolar, basically. Uh, well, I should say simpler. Millimolar is 10 to the negative 3 molar. Nanomolar is 10 to the negative 9 molar. So they, they are, this one is much smaller. Okay, so more than 10,000 times smaller. Okay, so... Um, there is a huge calcium gradient going into the cell, basically. So, what's going to happen is that calcium ions are going to move in through these voltage-gated calcium channels every time they open. So you're going to get a calcium current coming in. So calcium concentration is going to go up in this axon growth cone. So, the whole point of that discussion was that every time you this neuron fires, what's happening in the axon growth cone is you are getting this pulsatility of um, action potentials. But more importantly, if I plot um, calcium concentration intracellularly in the growth cone versus time, 
then what I get is a pulsatility of calcium, i.e. every time I fire an action potential, I get a pulse of calcium in. Every time I fire an action potential, I get a pulse in. So I'm getting pulsatile calcium oscillations in my axon growth cone, and we know that those pulsatile calcium oscillations are very important because they're going to influence cyclic AMP levels. Okay, right. So, uh, you might be wondering, when are we going to get to Ephrin A? And we are, but this is really, really important because the actions of Ephrin A are completely determined, uh, are completely, um, really, really, it, they, Ephrin A doesn't work if you get rid of these oscillations of calcium, basically. Right, okay, so, now let's go on. What do these oscillations in calcium do? Well, there's another enzyme, well, there's another structure in the cell membrane, uh, which is adenylylcyclase 1, okay? So, let me draw adenylylcyclase 1 in the membrane. So, here is adenylylcyclase 1. So, it has uh, a transmembrane domain 1. So, let me draw this cell membrane. Okay, in fact, let me go over onto it. I don't like having so little space. Let me draw it on the other side. So, here is the... Axon, uh, the cell membrane of this axon growth cone. And basically, here we have adenylylcyclase 1. So we have this transmembrane domain 1, which consists of these six membrane spanning alpha helices. We have the C1 loop connecting transmembrane domain 1 to transmembrane domain 2 over here, TM2. And then coming off TM2, we have this C2 portion over here, which can be divided into C2A and C2B. And similarly, C1 over here can be divided into C1A and C1B. Right. Okay, so uh, this is adenylylcyclase 1. Basically, when adenylylcyclase 1 is inactive, then the two portions of the actual adenylylcyclase enzyme are not together. They need to be dimerized in order for an enzyme to actually be active. So here is C1A. And here is C2A. And C1A and C2A are the two portions of the actual active adenylylcyclase enzyme. So if you want your adenylylcyclase enzyme to actually be active, you need to bring this C1A and this C2A together to get an actual active adenylylcyclase enzyme. So when those two portions dimerize, they make the active, um, the active enzyme. Okay, right. So when it's inactive, what you have is you have a apocalmodulin molecule bound to C1B, okay? So adenylylcyclase 1 does not have its own calcium sensor. Instead, it relies on uh, another calcium sensor that's used all over the place in the cell, which is calmodulin. So calmodulin structure is that it has two lobes, an N lobe and a C lobe. So let's say this is the N lobe, and this is the C lobe. All right. And on each of those two lobes, you have two calcium binding domains, which are EF hand binding domains, uh, which is just a certain type of polypeptide uh, structure which can bind calcium. Okay, so you have these two um, calcium binding domains on each of these lobes of calmodulin. Now, when no calcium, uh, sorry, when no calcium is bound to these binding sites, then the molecule is known as apocalmodulin. So apocalmodulin refers to a calmodulin molecule that has no calcium. Now, what happens is the apocalmodulin binds to the C1B portion of this adenylylcyclase 1 enzyme. Now, when calcium binds to those four calcium binding domains of apocalmodulin, what you get is um, you get uh, the calcium calmodulin complex forming. And basically, it changes the conformation of the calmodulin. The lobes move further away. And this, uh, what was a linear polypeptide that connected the two lobes, now takes on an alpha helix structure. So you get basically like this spring-like structure between these two lobes that are now further away. So you can see they were kind of sort of bent back towards each other in apocalmodulin, whereas now they're as far away as they can possibly be. Okay, so this is the calcium calmodulin complex with calcium bonded in those bounds to those four uh, calcium binding sites. So this is calcium calmodulin complex. Right, okay, so, 
uh, what happens when calcium goes up. We've discussed already that what is happening in these axon growth cones is that we're getting these pulsatile levels of calcium. So if this is time, and this is calcium level here, calcium intracellularly, what you get is a pulsatile level of calcium like so. You're getting pulses of calcium going up. Now, calcium is going to bind to apocalmodulin. It's going to convert that apocalmodulin bound to C1b into calcium calmodulin complexes. That's going to then uh, change the conformation of C1b. And what it does is it favours the dimerization of C1a with C2a. When there's calcium calmodulin bound to C1b, it just favours the dimerization of C1a and C2a. So you get the dimerization of C1a and C2a, and you get the active adenylyl cyclase being formed. Once the active adenylyl cyclase is formed, it's going to convert ATP into cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate. So you're going to get cyclic AMP being made. So if we were now to plot cyclic AMP levels um, against time, then what we would see is a graph like this. We'd see that when calcium goes up, cyclic AMP also goes up. So we're going to get pulses of cyclic AMP because calcium will activate this adenylyl cyclase 1. So, in axon growth cones, you are getting pulsatile uh, pulses. You're getting this oscillation, this in-phase oscillation of cyclic AMP levels. Right. Okay. Now, what does cyclic AMP do? Well, cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. So, uh, let's draw this next. So, also in the membrane of the axon growth cone, what you're going to have is you're going to have an ACAP12 binding your uh, type 2 protein kinase A to the membrane. So, this is ACAP12, standing for A kinase anchoring protein. So, this is just a scaffold protein on which protein kinase A is going to be, well, protein kinase A of the second type is going to be uh, bound. So here's ACAP12. It's also sometimes called gravin, or you might also uh, see it called ACAP250 because that's its weight. Its weight is 250 kilodaltons. So ACAP250, ACAP12, gravin, whatever you want to call it, it's a great big scaffold protein that binds one domain to the membrane of the cell and then also has another domain where it binds protein kinase A. So now let's draw our protein kinase A molecule, our um, protein here. Okay, so protein kinase A consists of a regulatory, well, it usually exists in these R2C2 complexes here, uh, which is um, you have two regulatory subunits, and because it's protein kinase A of the second type, this is the second regulatory subunit, and the difference is that protein kinase A type 2 is bound to scaffold proteins, whereas protein kinase A type 1 is not bound to scaffold proteins. And this is why the regulatory subunit is important, because the regulatory subunit is what binds to ACAP12. And in the, the regulatory unit of the second type binds to ACAP12, whereas the regulatory subunit of the first type doesn't. Okay, so... Here are the catalytic subunits bound to the regulatory subunits, and when they're bound to the regulatory subunits, they are inactive. Okay, so at the moment, the protein kinase A enzyme is here. This is the R2C2 complex. We've got two regulatory subunits and two catalytic subunits, and at the moment, it's the inactive protein kinase A. Now, when cyclic AMP goes up, what happens to this enzyme is that the regulatory subunits change conformation, so they change like so. Okay, and when they change like this, so this is cyclic AMP binding to them, so I'll draw cyclic AMP binding to these four cyclic AMP binding sites. And when, they, when cyclic AMP binds to these four cyclic AMP binding sites, the catalytic subunits are now released. And when they're released from the regulatory subunits, they become active. Okay, and what these catalytic subunits are believed to do this is the important thing. This is the crunch line of it all. Why are we doing this? Um, what these catalytic subunits are believed to do is they are either phosphorylate reanidine receptors or IP3 receptors. The important thing is that they cause the release somehow of intracellular calcium stores. So they go 
to the sarcoplasmic or endoplasmic reticulum, well, endoplasmic reticulum in this case, because we're talking about neurons. So they go to the endoplasmic reticulum and they trigger calcium release. And we believe they do this by interacting either with realidine receptors in the endoplasmic reticulum or by interacting with um, IP3 receptors, phosphorylating one of the two. But we don't yet know which one it is. Okay, so we believe this is either a realidine receptor or an IP3 receptor, which are both found in the uh, membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is the ER. Right, so what's the important thing then? When you get cyclic AMP pulses, you're also going to get protein kinase A activity pulses. And protein kinase A activity pulses are going to lead to calcium being released from the sarcoplasmic, well, the endoplasmic reticulum. So they're also going to lead to huge, great calcium pulses within the axon terminal, basically. Okay, much bigger than these calcium pulses. These calcium pulses work pathetic compared to these calcium pulses. So you're going to get huge, great calcium pulses uh, within the axon growth cone. Okay, right. Uh, so that whole mechanism there was just to amplify these calcium pulses. The important thing is that you have these calcium oscillations in the axon growth cone. Right. Okay, so now finally we'll get to Ephraim, but we'll do that in the next video.